That's my iPad because I'm going to use it in a little bit as a whiteboard. So, all right. Did you get to, I don't know, how many of you took books home with you? I did. I did. Okay. So maybe some of you got to read the little section. It wasn't much this time, um, like a paragraph. It was okay, but it wasn't like the, we're going to get a lot more in depth than what they did. So um, we're going to start off talking about the third commandment tonight. Um, but before we do, just a, a check-in. How's everything going um, as far as praying and, and spiritual time and all the stuff that you do on your own? Um, I know some of you have been using like the little commandment sheets that I've been giving out. Um, some didn't like it, some did. So those of you who are using them, what do you think about those? They're helpful. I, I think they're, they're interesting too. I've, some are better than others. Yeah. Well, his goal was to write a, a devotional book that would allow you to go the 50 days of Easter. Um, and so there was a lot of, a lot of stuff he had to cover. So yeah. anytime you get something like that, sometimes it's going to be a little bit better. Sometimes it can be a little bit worse. Well, in this particular one, uh, it had a day for Sunday and it really has a lot of room to, to report things, but it doesn't have much substance in its writing. Well, that's because it's relying on the brilliance of your pastor and the wonderful things that he or she says during the worship service for you to, you know, spark something and write something. I see. I see. So well, are we that sure didn't, that, that? If that didn't happen, you should consider firing that pastor. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> stuck with us. <laughs> So we've let's waited, start. We've waited too long. I don't think we're going to fire you easily. Mm -hmm. Let's start talking about the third commandment. So the third commandment is found in Exodus 20, starting at verse 8. So if you want to turn to that, I'll give you a second to get there. So Exodus 20, verse 8. <laughs> All right. Everybody there? Yep. All right. So Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Um, some of your Bibles probably have the word Lord capitalized, like all four letters are capitalized. The reason for that is that is them telling you that the English has been translated from the Hebrew the, with the word that we talked about last week time we met, the one that we don't know how to pronounce, the one that we say is Adonai. So that's the English way of saying, hey, this is the Tetragrammaton. This is the, the, the name of the Lord. So what do you hear in that commandment? Chick-fil-A is right. Okay. Chick-fil-A is right. What? <laughs> Chick-fil-A. Hobby, 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 hobby. <laughs> but they let people work in their landscaping on Sunday, and they let people work on building their building on Sunday. So they're not 100% sticking to it. Maybe they're Jewish. No, no, I don't uh, think they are. I think 
No. The landscapers. And, and I oh, them. oh, so Jewish landscapers and builders. <laughs> They've worked out a partnership with Chick-fil-A to work on opposite days. Right. It's hard for me to miss it because I drive by them on my way to the church. And there they are working in the yard or when they were building the building, they were hard at it. Maybe they hire Seventh-day Adventists. Oh, no. <laughs> Okay, Sorry. let's not go down that rabbit hole. Uh, okay. Um, it's just an observation. So there's one word that keeps repeating in here, Sabbath. What does Sabbath mean? Seventh rest. Day. Okay, rest. Seventh day. Seventh day. So... All right, this is where I use the whiteboard because I get talking about Hebrew. <laughs> um, all right. Rosie, we can see you. You don't have to make that face. <laughs> we all, right. all made that face inside, Rosanne. <laughs> all right, so your screen is about to go white if it hasn't already. And I'm going to write the word up here. So the Hebrew word for Sabbath is Shabbat. You have to be able to draw a straight line. <laughs> so, Shabbat. <clears throat> what it literally means in Hebrew is take a rest or take a holiday or stop. Um, it is one of the older Hebrew words, and it's probably a loan word from Assyria. Um, from, I can't remember what language they spoke, but whatever language it was, it's probably a loan word from them um, that was then picked up in a number of different languages. So the Greek New Testament translates uh, Shabbat as Sabbaton, um, basically just transliterating it into Hebrew or into Greek, which is why English says Sabbath. We just added a few letters. Um, so, stop share. Okay. So, stop what you're doing, take a holiday. That's the meaning of Sabbath. The first time it appears, though, is not in Exodus. The first time we hear about Sabbath is in Genesis, specifically Genesis chapter 2, 2 through 3, if you want to turn to that. So, Genesis 2, verse 2 through 3. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So, just like the commandment basically says, the origin of the Sabbath is creation. You know, God created the heavens and the earth and everything here in six days, and then on the seventh day, was a day for rest, a day for recuperation, basically. Um, so Sabbath, between Greek and Hebrew, appears in the Bible 389 times, which is up there. There's not many words that compare with how often that comes up. Love is one of them. Um, so is grace. But 389 times a lot for a particular word. What do you think God meant for us to get out of Sabbath? You know, why would it have been so important for not just for God in the creation story, but also for the Hebrews at Mount Sinai when God is given the law? You know, why would this be one of the commandments? Well, my first thought is that like some of the other laws, not necessarily the commandment, but some of the other laws that were passed down to the Hebrews, that uh, some of them had essentially health reasons behind them as far as, you know, touching unclean things and then having to really become ritually clean before you could do 
to other stuff, especially religious stuff. But I think that the idea of keeping the Sabbath as a day of rest was in a way a, a health law that God was passing down to the people, that they couldn't work, 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 work all the time. They needed a day of rest. I think that's definitely part of it. I think there's one other aspect to it, though. What else could make God want you to have a day off? Well, it points towards Jesus. I mean, he's supposed to be our rest. So, I mean, and just like God rested on the seventh day, he expects us to do the same. Yeah. Well, and I think he expects us to be serving him or thinking of him as as we rest and 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 to honor him on that day yeah. which, is what, which is what Stephen said in the chat just now he said a day to give him thanks and praise a day will be rest and recognize god for his work so okay, that's good steve yeah so it's a, it's a grant from god that's a time for rest and rejuvenation it's a time for prayer and worship it's an intentional break in the cycle because left to our own devices, the cycle becomes work, 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 achieve, 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 you know, hit all these bucket list goals you have in your life and all these things that you want to do. This is God breaking in and saying, Hey, you're becoming self-destructive. You need to focus on what's important. How about take a seat? The interesting thing is that, even before the Israelites were given this commandment, they were actually already observing it. So if you go back, look at Exodus 16, starting at the 22nd verse. So Exodus 16, 22. On the sixth day, they gathered to they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And no, I do not know what an omer is. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil and all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning, as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now, what do you think they're talking about gathering? This is when they're still just out of Egypt. It's the manna. Right, mm -hmm. manna. Does anybody know what manna means? Graham crackers. No, not quite. So... <laughs> If you think back to just a little bit before this, when the Israelites first discover manna because they're hungry in the wilderness and they pray to God and they walk out in their tents the next morning, there's just flaky white stuff all over the ground. And they realize that it tastes like bread made with honey or with oil. And they don't know what it is. So the name manna in Hebrew literally means, what the heck is that? That's, that's the PG way of saying it. It's actually a little bit more explicit. Basically, they came out of their tent and was like, what the heck is that? So that's what manna means. Just That's your trivia point for tonight. Okay. Well, don't you, didn't they have to cook it, though? So they could, eat it, it like a they could eat it the way it was, or they could boil it and make it into larger cakes. But if they tried to keep it overnight, it would mold and get worms in it. The only time that wasn't true was when the when they collected twice on on friday so that they had it for saturday which was the sabbath so 
So we've got the, the baseline idea of what the Sabbath is and, and what this commandment is talking about more or less, at least scripturally. So the question then becomes, what did the world do with it? Um, well, it's kind of what we do with everything, right? We messed it up. We overinterpreted it. We turned it into a stick to beat people with. So if you think about the Gospels, Jesus has these Sabbath day controversies with the Pharisees all the time. It, it almost makes you feel like the Pharisees are like following Jesus around and hiding behind corners just so if he bends down and grabs something on the Sabbath, they can jump out and like, I got you, I got you, I saw it. Um, that's probably not how it was, but that's the way the gospel writers make it seem. But the whole reason you have these Sabbath controversies is because the law has been interpreted so strictly at this point that you can essentially do nothing on the Sabbath. I mean, nothing. If your horse fell into a ditch, it was going to sit there until Sunday because you couldn't work on the Sabbath to get it out. Um, part of the reason for this makes sense, though. When the Israelites returned from exile in Babylon, the scholars of the people, the, the religious scholars, got together and, and they truly codified what they had been given scripturally to that point. And then they went to the, the leaders of the people and said, we need to enforce this and make sure people listen to God's law because we don't want to get exiled again. We don't want any more people coming in here and taking us off to some foreign land. So because of their fear of being taken away again, they interpreted the law so strictly so that people wouldn't anger God. It didn't work, but that was the goal. So we know that regular people, non-Jews, weren't observing any kind of Sabbath. Okay, and we can tell that from an account in First Corinthians. Turn, if you would, to First Corinthians 11, starting at verse 17. We're going to get a full Bible workout tonight. First Corinthians what? First Corinthians 11:17. Well, I have picked up my my little study Bible I used to use a lot, and it's tabbed. I'd forgotten it's tabbed. It's wonderful. All right. So, 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. Now, in giving the follow instruction, following instructions, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must, in fact, be divisions among you, so that those of you who are approved may be evident. Now, when you come together at the same place, you are not really eating the Lord's Supper. For when it is time to eat, everyone proceeds with his own supper. One is hungry, and another becomes drunk. Do you not have houses so that you can eat and drink? Or are you trying to show contempt for the church of God by shaming those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I will not praise you for this. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. For this reason, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself first, and in this way let him eat the, eat the bread and drink of the cup. For the one who eats and drinks without careful regard for the body eats and drinks judgment against himself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and quite a few are dead. But if we examined ourselves, we would not be judged." But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you assemble, it does not lead to judgment. I will give directions about other matters when I come. So 
Does anybody know what that passage is about? Tie the Lord's Supper. Okay. So this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth, which is a Greek city. And he's writing about their practice of the Lord's Supper. Okay. So this is how we know that, that Christians, once they were sundered from their, from their Jewish temples, were not observing the Sabbath. Okay? Because the account we have here from Paul of people observing church, the Lord's Supper, is that not everybody's able to get there at the same time. The rich people are able to get there early. The poor people have to wait until they get off work. So we know that people aren't taking a day off like they used to right? And what's happening here is that by the time the poor people get off work and get to the Lord's Supper, which at this time was more than just bread and wine, it was a whole meal in addition to the bread and wine. Most of the food is gone, most of the drink is gone, and they're left with scraps because the rich people have taken it all and are already drunk. And so Paul says, when you gather, whenever you gather, wait for one another. If you're that hungry, eat something before you come. That way you don't have to eat all the food before everybody gets there. So, and incidentally, that's also where we get the words of institution that we use every Sunday. Um, so that's all lifted straight out of the Bible. Okay. So questions about that, because that's like bouncing around a little bit, but it's helpful examples to see different things in the Bible. Okay. Wait, I have a question. Yeah. Wait, I, I, I'm formulating it here. Okay. Um, go, to, go to verse 30. That is why many of you are weak and sick and quite a few are dead. Yeah, that's Paul. Yeah, that's not right. No, for Paul... Remember that the the letters in the Bible that Paul wrote were exactly that they were letters and Paul would probably be, be absolutely horrified to find out that we put his letters in the Bible and called it scripture. He would be terrified just like you would be if somebody one day took something you wrote and canonized it. Okay, because none I'm of us feel forward like, to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, this is Paul trying to explain to them that they're, they're eating to their detriment. They're abusing the Lord's Supper and that they're falling into sin and sin, the wages of sin is death. And so, you know, he's saying, hey, lay off of this because this is the kind of thing that's killing you. You know, now, was the Lord actually striking down people because they weren't waiting for poor people to come and eat? No, but that would have been enough to put the fear of God into all of them and make them stop doing it. So, you know, there's, there's that. Um, the tradition of keeping the Sabbath very, very strictly did not die in the Old Testament. If you are familiar with Orthodox Judaism in the modern world, Orthodox Judaism or Orthodox Jews keep the law as closely as they possibly can. The strictest interpretation of the law. Um, you'll see Orthodox Jews in New York City with the, the real big beard and the, the long ringlets on the side and stuff um, because of a prohibition against cutting hair. Um, you'll see that a lot of them wear um, uh, the mezuzah, or they have the mezuzah, which is um, a little good. round thing um, that they put the on their doorpost. And it's Deuteronomy 6, 4, um, hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and your mind. Um, and it's all because the next verse says, you will put this on your doorpost. You will bind it to your, to your heart. You will, you know, and so they literally take that seriously and they, they put it on their forehead. And yeah, um, if you are an Orthodox Jew, on Friday afternoon, you make sure that you have all your ducks in a row because at sundown on Friday, you are not able to do any kind of work. And that means that if you forget to turn on your living room light before sundown, then you're just going to have to go without your living room light 
for all of the Sabbath because you can't get up and go flip that light switch. So there are people who live near Orthodox communities who actually make a little bit of money by going around on the Sabbath day and checking to make sure that everybody has their light switches on and stuff like that, because they, they're Gentiles, they can turn it on. So, you know, it hasn't gone by the wayside. There are people who still live according to this and, and are very, very serious that no work can be done on the Sabbath. The only thing that can be done is rest and worship. And even then, but they say what? They can pay to have it done, though, in their, yes. in their stead. Yes. We, that's the same thing that the Chick-fil-A is doing that I mentioned <laughs> yeah. before. Yeah. Okay. And so even, even then, you know, they have to make sure that they're within walking distance of a synagogue because you can only walk a certain distance on the Sabbath before it's considered work, according to Jewish law. So, and you can't drive. Wasn't that also um, the beginning when the Puritans came to this country, that they were oh, yeah. very similar. Yeah, the Puritans were um, uh, Christian uh, fanatics, essentially, uh, <laughs> and and interpreted everything very, very strictly, which is you know where the whole idea of the Scarlet Letter um, is that Nathaniel Hawthorne who wrote that. Yes. Um, that's where it comes from, is Puritan culture. So. Well, I can tell you, they live up to that. When they say sundown, they mean it because my company is ran by Jewish people. And when it comes to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, make sure you have your butt in the doors before sundown. Yep. Yep. So Rosh Hashanah is oh. the Jewish New Year and Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. So. Well, one thing that concerns me is what you said about Paul wrote letters and he would be uh, embarrassed that they became scriptures mm -hmm. and that this didn't really actually happen. That people were, that died and they become sick and weak. And I've always been taught that you just believe what was in the Bible. Well, I'm not saying don't believe what's in the Bible. I'm saying that Paul is using that as a tactic to get people to listen. Okay. He's not, what he's saying is that they're, they're causing their own death by not exercising the Lord's Supper correctly. Okay. And, you know, we know that there's more than just that cause of death. Certainly the wages of sin is death. Okay. The more you sin, the more, you know, you're going to die regardless. But he's using that more as like a threat to them. He's using it like the modern day preachers are talking about that um, there are hurricanes or 9-11 or something because of the godless cities yeah. or whatever. And yeah. the judgment well, is not here yet. There, there was one that said that hurricanes were caused by gay people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, apparently... I guess, you know, every time they go on a cruise, you know, a terrible hurricane comes. So there's that. Um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have Paul's letters in there. Okay. Don't, don't hear me say that because I'm firmly of the belief that, that the Bible is inerrant in that whatever is in there is supposed to be in there. That doesn't mean it doesn't disagree with itself in places because it does, because it was written by people inspired by God. Okay. It doesn't mean that there are things in there that don't make any sense to us now because it was written in some cases four or 5,000 years ago, you know, but I do believe that everything in there is in there because God wanted it in there for some reason. I just don't always understand the reason. Like I will never understand the reason God decided the book of revelation should be included because it has not done anything but confuse people for 2000 years. Although there's a lot of hope in Re Revelation also. Yeah. What did you say? <laughs> what did you say, Bonnie? What's this Linda? I'm sorry, Bonnie. I'm sorry. I'll just have to remember I'm old. <laughs> what did you say, Linda? 
<laughs> I said there's a lot of hope in Revelation. Oh, hope as, in Revelation. As, as in, I've read the back of the book and we win. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you're, <laughs> okay. You're going to hear more about that on Sunday, too. So the parable we have this Sunday is the parable of the weeds, and it's an interesting one. Um, <laughs> so let's look at Luther's explanation real quick. So Luther says that for this commandment, we are to fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching or God's word, but instead keep that word holy and gladly hear it and learn it. So basically Luther's arguing that this is the, the strict enforcement of this law is not the intention of the law. It's not the intention of the commandment. Okay, that's, that's kind of a ceremonial thing that was added on. What Luther says is that Christians should use this time to have worship. And because that's what you're doing, and that doesn't matter on the day of the week, even though Jews keep the Sabbath on Saturday, which is when God says the Sabbath is, Christian Sabbath can be any time that you are taking the time to worship God. It's supposed to be a time for worship. Rest, of course, too, but worship. So in our case, Sunday becomes the Sabbath, um, if what we're doing is going to church that day. But then Luther goes on to say in the large catechism that just because you go to church doesn't mean you're keeping the Sabbath. If you go to church and you don't get anything out of it, you just go because it's a habit, and you don't hear anything from the sermon or from the music or anything like that, then you haven't actually worshiped God. You've just gone and essentially we're back to eating to your own detriment. You know, you're making a mockery of God at that point. Um, so, yeah. So Luther is, Luther thinks that we should keep the Sabbath in that we should go to church and learn something and worship God and rest so that we are regenerated and recharged to go out and face the craziness of the world again. You know, Luther would say that we're simultaneous saint and sinner, and we are. Okay? You know, just as soon as you do a good thing, you're going to turn around and do a bad thing, you know, without even meaning to. This is an opportunity. The Sabbath is an opportunity to feed that saint part because you're going to have to go back out into the world and deal with all the setter part. And the world has a real strong pull on that center part of us. Okay. So thoughts on the third commandment. Anything <sighs> unclear or anything we need to go back to? Well, it does say that there was not a specified particular day. Right. Um, right. But whatever day that you choose. Yeah. Yeah. And regard as special, you do so to the Lord. But it says that the church worships together, especially on Sunday, because Christ rose from the dead on Sunday. Right. And you'll see that there's a document the ELCA has called the use of the means of grace. And that's what the use of the means of grace says, is that, you know, our day of worship, the Lord's day, is Sunday, because that is historically the day of the week that we say Christ rose from the grave. Um, whereas with the Jews... Their Sabbath is Saturday because of the way they number the week. The seventh day is Saturday, and so it's the Sabbath. So it's all it's us taking things as literally as we can without getting crazy. So, any other questions on the third commandment? It isn't a question so much, but I did want to just say that something that I've tried to do in the, the, the last year or so is do less on Sunday. I have, I can't say that I do no work on Sunday, but I do try to make uh, my, I cook my dinners on Saturday and reheat leftovers on Sunday. I tend to do that just so that I don't feel that, obligation on Sunday. I want, I want to try to, even though I'm retired and theoretically I'm at rest all the time because of that, I want to keep Sunday more 
relaxation, more rest, more restoration. And so I try to, to move my daily chores off of Sunday and try to do them either Saturday or save them till Monday. Just something that I've started doing in the last year or so. Well, I had to leave for a few minutes, and I hope I didn't miss anything. But uh, is counsel considered work or, wor or worship? So Good question. So counsel is doing the work of the Lord. So, you know, where when we the ideal way for us to be in counsel is to to meet to not just talk about financial stuff, but also to talk about you know, the different directions the church is moving to reach out to the community. So in that, that is talking about our worship, if not actually worshiping. It's also so why we really, start with a devotional. So it's really, a, it's really both, kind of. Yeah, it's kind of a both and. Lexi wants to say goodnight to everyone. Good night, Lexi. Good night, honey. Good night, Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> so. But no, you cannot get out of council on Sunday because you want to observe the Sabbath. It was worth a try. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> well, well, I'm sure that other uh, congregations have their council meetings on weekdays. Yeah, there's there's weekdays. some that have it on, like my internship congregation had it on Tuesdays in the afternoon. You know, so. Well, we used to have it not on Sunday years ago. Uh, but it wasn't because of this. It was just because. But but let me clarify something else. If I decide to come home and transcribe those notes on Sunday, then that's work. That's work. But remember what Luther says about this. Okay, Luther isn't insisting that you do no work. Luther says that, that the idea of doing no work and doing nothing and just sitting there is an idea that got blown out of proportion sometime way back when. Luther is saying that as long as you're using the day to worship God at some point and that you're allowing yourself some type of rest, then you're observing the Sabbath as Christians are called to. So he's not saying don't do any work. He's saying that, you know, make sure your top priority on that day is to worship God and to give yourself some rest. Does that make more sense? Yes. Is that mentioned in the big book? If I read the big book? That means you can wait till Monday actually. Hmm. Well, I never do it. I haven't done it on Sunday, I don't think, but I'm just trying to understand using that as a, an example. So what he's saying is if our priority is to get up and get ourselves to church and 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 worship, then and you get something out work. of it. Well, so that just going to on the path. Well, but it also depends on the worshiper. Okay. So just going to yes, church. Correct. Just going to church and to sitting there because that's what you've always done. That's that's not worshiping. You know, that's you just hanging out in the club. You know, going to church and actually listening to what's going on around you, reading the scripture, singing the songs, whatever it is that makes you feel worshipful. You know, even if it is listening to the sermon or if it's not, you know, whatever you do, as long as you're getting something out of it, then you're worshiping. If you're going there, you don't come back with okay. anything more than what you started with. You haven't worshiped. Which gives the name Sunday Christian lip service the whole nine yards. Yeah. Yeah, like the people who show up on Christmas and Easter, we call them creasters. Uh, you know, we love them, we want them here, but they're only going to be here on Christmas and Easter. Or when they bring their child to be Christian, christened, or yeah, whatever they call baptized it, baptized or or confirmation. A lot of times. For some reason, we have the idea in the Lutheran Church that confirmation is some form of graduation, and once you're confirmed, you don't have to come back to church. Um, and I, I don't know where that idea came from, but it's not true. You know, just because you're confirmed doesn't mean you graduated from Jesus High and can go do what you want to do. 
Well, right. what, so, what you said that Luther's opinion is, is that written down somewhere in a paragraph? Is it in that big book, the, the big textbook? It's kind of in there. Most of what I'm drawing from is a large catechism, which is the better explanation of things, but much longer. So. Okay. Well, it, it helped me a lot, what you said. Okay. I'm glad. That Luther said, yeah. that Luther's opinion was, or whatever. All right. So let's move to the fourth commandment. Um, as we oh, move we'll, to the... Wait. One second. Okay. This paper you gave us, I do have a question about it. Yes. May I stop you? Do buildings, land, and people need rest to be restored? We've established that people need to stop and think about things. But what about the buildings, really? I don't know about buildings, but creation itself, you know, does. And creation, I mean, if you think about it, the one good thing that came out of the lockdown that we went through, not that South Carolina had a real lockdown, otherwise we wouldn't have so many cases. But when so much of the country was under lockdown, you saw creation, nature, starting to heal itself. You started seeing these animals in places where they hadn't been seen in years in parks and stuff. You started seeing, you know, pe people are reporting all kinds of things like that. And, and it was creation taking a breath because all those nasty, loud, mean humans had gone away for a little while, you know? So I, I would argue that creation certainly needs a break from time to time. I don't know about buildings. Um, I've never seen a building get upset that somebody was in it and like fall down. Okay. I'm, I'm hoping that doesn't happen because I happen to be in a building right now and it's, it's a little old and they did and notch out some bricks over here. So, well, you when know I, what to say, if you sit on the opposite side of the church, the walls might crumble. Yeah. Well, there's that. <laughs> when I was reading that, that sentence in, in there and I, like Sandy, I, I felt the same way. And I, I asked myself about buildings. I know the land needs needs it. I mean, creation, like you said, but also uh, you're not supposed to plant the same field over and over and over and over again. You need to give the land rest. Yeah, it's got to have time to lie fallow. Right. But I was thinking about buildings because that that made me wonder too and it occurred to me that just having no people in a building would actually freshen the air in a way uh, as far as uh, just I don't know I don't know exactly how to explain that but I just feel that you know you've got all this carbon dioxide coming out all the time and all that and a building that's empty for a day, a week, whatever, gets some kind of refreshing of the oxygen content or whatever. I get that. I, I do think we should let the record reflect that our council president just said that we stink and we're full of hot air. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for putting that on the record. I appreciate that. So, oh, make, sure that's, make sure that's reflected in the official minutes of this, Barbara. <laughs> so. Not doing minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. No, they, do, they do say the church is not the building. It's yeah. Not the people. yeah. All right. Well, Are we ready to move me, to? Go ahead, Barbara. Let me just say this. Trees and the land, they all have life. A building is a, is a, a tangible thing that does not have life. And, to, and so to me, well, that's the difference. And creation, I agree with, but the building, even, even with Bonnie's big dissertation, I don't see it. I, I see it from both sides, so. All right, so fourth commandment. As we move to this, we move out of the section of the commandment specifically about God and how our relationship to God is supposed to be. And we move into the commandments about how our relationship with our neighbors are supposed to be. And so the very first neighbor that God wants us to talk about is somebody very close to us, our fathers and our mothers. 
So Exodus 20, 12 is the fourth commandment. And it's really short, so I'll just read it. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Pretty simple, that right? Want... That's Exodus twenty twelve. Thank you. Yep. So pretty simple, at least in scripture, right? Honor your father and mother so your days will be long upon the earth. But what does it mean to honor? Respect and obey. Okay, so respect and obey. There what are else? some parents that it is very difficult to honor. And I think that in that case, um, basically not bad mouthing them or killing them yeah. might be the best that you can do to honor them. That's, it's, it's, it's hard. We're gonna get to that part because that's a, an important caveat to this commandment. Um, so Stephen said, respect, no talking or no back talking, mom or dad will kill you. Um, so I hope that's not gonna actually happen because that makes it premeditated now. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Um, so when I think of honor, I think of deference, um, humility. So humbling yourself before somebody you consider to be greater than yourself. Um, and, you know, that honor is directed towards the person that God has declared your parents to be, not necessarily the parents that they are. Okay. You're, you're more giving respect to the office of parenthood, for lack of a better word. Okay, um, just like there are people who do not politically agree with the president, but by and large, <laughs> they should respect the office of the presidency and at least wish that the president would do well and succeed for the country's sake. That's, you know, you may not agree, but that's, that's where the respect lies. You're essentially according the same respect to your parents that you would at least in part to God, not the same amount, because God is clearly greater than all things. But so it's interesting that love is commanded for all neighbors. Um, you know, that's very clear throughout scripture, but honor is specifically for certain categories of people. You honor God, you honor your parents. And because this commandment deals with authority, you also honor the authorities who are around you, the ones who order civil life, who protect you and who, who make sure that the world doesn't come completely unglued. Um, so we honor and love their God-given position, not their personal quirks. For the Jews, this would have been a little different. So, Jewish society, especially in the days of Moses and the Exodus, is very much a patriarchal society. Um, in Latin, it's pater familias, so the head of the family is the father, basically. But maternal influence is important, too, because the father was in charge of the family, but the only way you continued with the Jewish identity was through your mother. Even today, if you are if you consider yourself a Jew, you've either converted or you're a Jew because your mother was a Jew. Okay, it does not run through the father, it runs through the mother. So both of them held important positions. And family life is important to these people at the time because if you remember, even after their time in Egypt, they're still organized according to the 12 tribes of Israel, which is the 12 patriarchs, uh, what is it? Jacob's sons, John, yeah. Anyway, I don't remember that part. So the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, so when you, when you think about that and the way those things were important, that explains why people get so upset with Jesus in the Gospels. Because there's at least a couple of accounts where in, in one case in Mark, Jesus' family shows up 
and they try to get him to come home because they think he's gone and lost his mind. They think he's, he's just going crazy. And he, he's like, you know, I'm not going with you. Who are my, who are, who's my family? These, all these people are my family, you know? And for the Jews, that would have been like, what did you just say to your mother? You're not going to do something. She said, um, did you not read that whole commandment about honor them? Did you didn't get that? Um, you know, and it, it, it's accounted in, in all the gospels. So that's something that, you know, it was really a big deal to somebody to hear Jesus say, you know, I'm not going to specifically listen to the direction of my mother in this case. Um, and there's some, there's some Gnostic, Do you know what Gnostic is? No. So the, the Gnostics were, they came after, after Jesus' time, after the disciples' time, when Christianity is really starting to spread and it's kind of diversifying, the Gnostics were people who thought that they had received special knowledge from God and that there was a, a duality where the body was evil and bad, but the soul was good and the soul would ascend to God eventually and achieve perfection and this icky, nasty, sinful body would stay behind and so when you hear people say, you know, someone's gone to be with Jesus, that's actually Gnosticism, and it's technically a heresy, um, you know, because they haven't actually left yet, according to Luther. They're still hanging out, waiting for Jesus. Yeah, it gets complicated, and it's fun. Theology is great. Um, yeah, so the, the Gnostics wrote some Gospels where they took – things from the, the four gospels we have now and they added some things. So there's, there's quite a few tales in the Gnostic gospels of Jesus telling his parents off. And, and even one time where Jesus gets mad at a friend when they're playing on the roof and Jesus pushes the friend off the roof and kills the kid friend. And then his mother yells at him and he goes down there and raises the kid from the dead. Um, yeah, it's, it's fun reading. It really is. It's, it's, yeah. So that's technically a rabbit hole, but an interesting one, nonetheless. So now you have a better understanding of why the whole family situation, honor your father and mother, was so important. So how do you do that? Um, you know, how do you honor somebody that much? You know, Stephen said something about it earlier with respectful behavior. Um, but it's also, you know, esteem them above all precious treasures. And this is what Luther says, too, is that, you know, your parents are special people. You should, you know, treat them as, as something precious. You should be respectful of them in as much as possible. You should honor them in action and care. So when they're old and feeble and, and you know, they need somebody to help them, you should be the person who's there, which makes you wonder about, the nursing homes that we have throughout our nation where people go and never see their family because they figure they can stick mom and dad in the home and not have to worry about them anymore. Um, and I, I talk about that because I had a lot of those on internship in Pennsylvania where we had probably a hundred parishioners. There's a big church in nursing homes and about half of them never saw their family because once they were there, nobody came to see them. So we were the only ones who did. Um, I tell you, there's another side of that. There are those of us that will fight tooth and nail to keep them out of the home. Oh yeah, and that's that would be in accordance with what Luther is saying here. You know that we should be trying to, in as much as possible, do that. It's not always possible. You know, when I was living with a camp in a camper, when my if my mom had gotten sick, <coughs> I, I'm not sure where I would have put her. Um, you know, nowhere comfortable, I'm sure. The closet wasn't very big. So, you know. Um, so the idea here is that this behavior, this, this intentional honoring of your parents brings about peace, okay? Peace in the family, peace with the kids so they are able to concentrate on what they're supposed to be doing, peace with the parents, so they can concentrate on their stuff and then peace in society as a larger unit. 
because if you have this kind of deference for authority, it's going to then translate to deference for civil authority. And so you're not going to go out and murder or kill your murder or steal or, you know, things like that because you respect the civil authorities and the laws they put in place. So it's, you know, almost a utopian thing in that you're going to increasingly make things better and more peaceful. At least that's how it's supposed to work. We know that that's not how it actually works very often at all, because one, a lot of times this doesn't happen. And two, um, the world's broken. Parents can be broken. You know, kids can be broken. Civil authorities can especially be broken, especially when they have power and it gets to their head. So before we get into that, are there any questions so far where we're at? Have I lost you? It was the tangent about Gnosticism, wasn't it? <laughs> well, well, just before you said, went on the tangent about Gnosticism, you mentioned uh, Jesus um, getting getting in his parents' face about uh, and and not obeying them exactly. Are are we basically talking there about uh, when he was twelve or so in, in the temple and he said, "I need to go about my father's business." So that's that's part of it, but what I'm talking about more is actually Jesus when he's an adult and he's preaching and he's getting himself in trouble and he's having these controversies with the Pharisees on the Sabbath and stuff. And so his parents actually come and say, or his mother and his brothers actually come and call for him and say, you need to come home with us. And Jesus says, I'm home among these people. These are my family, you know? So he extends the definition of family farther so he can, get out of paying attention to his mother. Okay, that's that's when I got to look up somewhere. I, I don't know where that is. Um, I'll look it up. You don't need to take it. My Bible just decided to didn't want to have it right anymore. I'll look it up at some point and, and tell you about it. That's um, fine. So, okay. All right, so... We talked about how families are supposed to, or parents are supposed to be honored, civil authorities, superiors. So, you know, your boss to some degree, people in authority in society, um, you know, and, and from that, from that peace that you get from, from working with them instead of against them, you achieve some measure of joy through the service you're doing in the community and in your job. You know, this is supposed to be the, the recipe for a fulfilling life, where you're happy in your vocation and, and things are good. Not necessarily perfect, but good. But what does this mean for parents? You know, are, are, are they supposed to be just these, these people who sit on their pedestal and get treated as honored beings and, and you know, can do no wrong? or are they held to a different standard? Incite not, incite not your children to wrath. Yeah. So Luther would say that, that the office of parenthood should be respected by the children and by society, but parents should be worthy of that honor and respect. So God doesn't give children just for parents' pleasure. They're not playthings for people to do as they want to with them. Okay, they're, they're gifts from God to be raised in a godly way and sent out into society to continue the process and continue God's mission. Okay, they're not for you to do whatever you want to and abuse them and do horrible things like we hear so often in the foster care system and everything else. Okay, when that happens, those parents have have taken the office of parenthood as God gave it and perverted it to their own sinful desires. And so those people have essentially declared themselves not worthy of being honored by this command because they've rejected what God says parenthood is. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, actually, I know a lot of parents that would say, you know, your children are your children are borrowed. 
God gives them to you for a little while because it also says in the Bible, well, as you get older, you will leave your mother and your father and you will go forward. Um, the same thing is true with, with civil authorities and with bosses. God doesn't give people employees to be abused and used and, and thrown out. Okay. Even if you are in a state like South Carolina with higher will fire will policies where you can be fired for any reason. You know, when I was a store manager for advance, when I got that store, my orders from my district manager were to go in that store, evaluate the employees and clean house because the store wasn't making target. The store wasn't performing like it was supposed to. They weren't, you know, up to, to appearance standards or inventory standards. And so the company said, it's the people get rid of them. I didn't do that. I went in, I sat down with each person. I got to know them. I found out what was going on with them and what was causing the issues, where the lack of training was and worked with them to get them where they needed to be. I lost a few because a few of them didn't want to change. It happens, but I wasn't going to go in there and treat them as disposable because that's not how they're supposed to be. They're people. They're people who need your care as a supervisor. When a supervisor or somebody in authority doesn't get that and doesn't try to do that, then they have declared themselves not worthy of this commandment. They're, they're going sinfully. And so, no, they're not going to get honor. And nobody's going to get in trouble for not giving them honor because they've decided they don't want it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's all about mutual relationship, right? So Ephesians 6, 1, which is another Pauline letter. Um, has an interesting take on this. So Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment accompanied by a promise. Namely, that it may go well for you will live a long time on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but raise them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. Um, of course, that letter rapidly goes, hill, goes downhill with the uh, slaves obey your masters and all that, but, you know, different time, different place. Which we can take as employees obey your supervisors. Yeah, and should be. Um, unfortunately, Paul does also have a a letter, Philemon, is a letter where a slave runs away to Paul and Paul sends them back with the odd request that they be sent back to him again so he can keep them. So, you know, it was times, literally. Um, but the, the idea is that, getting back to this commandment, the idea is that we are supposed to be in a mutual relationship. Okay? Honor is supposed to move up from from children to their parents, no matter what age they are. But honor is also supposed to move down from parents to their children. It's supposed to be a mutual thing. I struggle with this at times, okay? You know, my dad passed away a long time ago, 2005, and I spent a lot of time angry at him for abandoning us, even though he hadn't, but that's how you feel, okay? And then, you know, my mom has had issues over the years that have strained our relationship. I am sure that that in 10 years when Lexi is a full on teenager and is screaming, I hate you from across the house, that there will be those same issues going on between us. Um, you know, hopefully I'll be able to continue honoring this commandment as much as possible. And, and the next one, you know, not strangling her. Um, and hopefully she will do the same, but you know, we'll see. I'm sure she'll still be respectful to all of y'all. She loves y'all. I'm just the one who gives her food, so. <laughs> so, all right. Any thoughts on the, the fourth commandment? Anything that doesn't make sense or that we haven't talked about? Well, if you, if you have a parent parents that are really 
terrible. Maybe murderers or, or beat you almost to death. What are you supposed to do with those parents? What's your attitude supposed to be? So according to Luther, you should still be mindful of the fact that they're your parents, um, but they have declared themselves not worthy of, of parenthood. Okay. They've sinned against God in a, in a heinous way. They've made themselves unhonorable or dishonorable. Okay. So at that point, you know, God's not gonna, gonna count it against you if you don't give like the same kind of honor you would to a parent that dotes on you and has been there for you every step of the way. Okay. Because they've stepped away from their role, they've broken the relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if they're not, so if they're not worthy of your respect, conceivably you could put them in a nursing home and just leave them there pay their bills, make sure they got care, but just turn your back on them. You could, but ideally it would be better if you didn't. Because, you know, there again, you have God constantly encouraging us to be better than others. So Sometimes, though, the, the hurt has just gone on so long. And if you have a parent who has been like this for... 70 years and then all of a sudden it's like oh you should bring me into your home and take care of me you're like i don't think so yeah and i get that mm -hmm. and i think god gets that too the only thing i'm saying is you know my role as a a leader in the church is to constantly push people to do good things even if they don't want to do them you know well how about and and i i have this how about children that were adopted because the parents the the birth parent didn't want that child didn't but that is it. is that in god's eyes not their parent the parent that adopted them and raised them is their parent i would think whoever has stepped into the office of parenthood is the parent so if somebody okay. had adopted a child you know then they're standing in that office and they deserve that honor and respect you know, you can't fault somebody because in some cases, people never find out they were adopted. You can't fault them for not knowing and not respecting somebody they didn't know existed. So, you know, I would imagine that's a universal thing. Well, Whoever's... I mean, we, I don't know. I mean, I was taught, yeah, there are parents out there. They've done some bad things, but in order for the healing start, I mean, the directive was always forgive them. Yeah. Well, you can, you can forgive somebody without condoning what they have done and without falling back into the cycle of abuse. So it's possible to say, you know, I understand that you are a broken person, that you can't help yourself and that you do bad things. And I love you because you're my parent and I, I honor you as much as possible because you're my parent, but I can't put myself back in this situation and continue further abusing myself. So then at that point, you do what you can to make sure they get the care they need and you get the care you need. You know, God doesn't want you to turn self-destructive just because of one commandment when the person is not actually trying to be worthy of what they're supposed to be. <laughs> What other thoughts? I think that this commandment should have come with a lot of footnotes. With a what? With a lot of footnotes, because oh. I think it, I think it's caused a lot of guilt. I think it's caused a lot of guilt in a lot of people trying to do what this commandment said and, and couldn't. Anything in the Bible can be used as a stick to beat somebody. Okay. Or yourself. Yeah, especially when it's taken out of its proper context. Okay, if we keep things in the context that God is a loving God who went 
beyond any actual need and created humanity to have a relationship with us, then it's obvious from the start that we should not be self-destructive to ourselves because God loves us, even if that's a love that we can only get from God and not from our parents or, you know, anything else. So we always have to look at scripture from the lens of love. You know, God is, is giving us these concepts, these laws, these commandments to help us protect ourselves and to make our world as peaceful as possible. When someone else breaks a commandment and it affects you, there's not a whole lot you can do about that. There's, there's a lot in this. There is. A, a lot. It really is. I agree with you. There I'm, is. I mean, I crawled inside of my head, so. So, and honestly, this is, this is the gift of scripture. You know, it's not just the Ten Commandments that are like this. There's a reason that I write, a, a, I write something before I write the sermon. It's a, an exegetical uh, paper, for lack of a better word where I take the time to go through and, and look at the scripture, usually in the original text, and, and take the time to compare it to other texts and to, to see things that I don't understand and to try to spend some time with it. You don't get as much of that as in a sermon as you would if you read the exegetical paper, you know, because there's some things that you just can't use in a sermon. But like the parable that we have this week, the parable of the weeds, you know, I was on a pericope Zoom meeting with some colleagues from seminary. We were on there for two hours last night talking about it because there's so much there. And it's only like 12 verses. You know, it's the way scripture is. There's so much in it because it comes from God. And God is so very much more than we can understand. That brings up something too, in a way. You, um, in looking at these thing, these comments from the small catechism, there's times I wonder, um, like on the the third commandment here, Luther's comments about we are to fear and love God so that we do not neglect His word and the preaching of it, but regard it as holy and gladly hear and learn it. This all comes from the six or seven words, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And it, it's like he's put so much more into that by talking about God, you know, listening to God's word and studying it and preaching it and all that. And I said, well, uh, that's all from keep the Sabbath holy. Mm -hmm. You remember I told you that the large catechism is the, the bigger version and it's meant for pastors and teachers and stuff. That's how Luther wrote it. Small catechism was for people to keep in their home and the large catechism was for teaching in church. And so the large catechism comment on the fourth commandment, honor your father and mother, is 16 pages long. Um, on the third commandment, it was like seven pages. On the first commandment, it was close to 20. <coughs> so, and this is what happens when you turn a theologian loose on a verse. They're going to look at it from every different direction. They're going to look under it and around it and try to understand the context of scripture. And yeah, you know, this is why they teach us the difference between theology and homiletics, which is preaching. You don't want me to get up there and, and do theology on Sunday because after about 20 minutes, everybody would be like, we really want him to shut up. You know? All right, so it is 8.15. What other questions, comments, concerns do we have before we leave it for the night? I'm glad we decided to do the small catechism. I am too. I was 
I was pleasantly surprised that this is the one y'all picked because I was expecting y'all to go with Genesis because I've never had anybody say, yeah, I want to do the small catechism. <laughs> um, I brought it up one time at my home parish years ago and people looked at me like I had grown a third head. Um, you know, just two on either side. <laughs> oh, I mean, we have had some instruction on the small catechism, but I think this is helping. It, it really is a better understanding because it's a lot more in depth. Yeah. So according to our schedule, next week is the fifth and sixth commandments. And then the week after that is a social week. So um, it's up to you all. Um, if you want to do a social week by actually having a Zoom meeting and talking or just having it as a week off. Um, it doesn't bother me either way, but we don't have to decide now. We can decide that next week. But next week, fifth and sixth That's commandment. Good. Okay. Sounds good. Any other questions, concerns, comments, smart remarks? <laughs> We don't have anybody does that. No, no, we don't. Not a single person. <laughs> I can't help myself. <laughs> and Matt, the lightning's going to strike. Not just you. Do I, John? I said you better stand back. Some lightning's going to strike. <laughs> yeah, well, I got enough metal in my office. It'll probably diffuse it. So, all right. So I'm going to end the recording here.